Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. It's just gone one o'clock so I'm just going to give everyone a chance to join. There are lots of people registered for today because it's a very popular topic. Um, if you joined online do feel free to drop into the Q&A box and say hi. We've disabled the chat feature as we've discovered it can cause problems for some people using screen readers. Hello, Kamal. Hello, Kiona, Gretchen from Oklahoma, uh, Peter, Gizzy, Janet. Uh, as, a, as a Welsh person, someone has commented um, from gorgeous sunny Wales and having grown up in South Wales, I'm not sure that sunny is the word that I'd use for my, uh, for my hometown, but uh, maybe a different part of Wales. Okay, I can see lots more of you have joined. I'll just give it a couple more moments. So you can't detect sarcasm with people's comments where they've said hello from Milton Keynes City of Dreams. <laughs> Hi, I, Laura. I, I don't know if that's sarcasm or if that's it is the City of Dreams. I've never been. I only know that Milton Keynes isn't it one of the only towns in the UK, cities in the UK that has flows to the grid system like they have in America. But um, yeah, I've only been once. I, I didn't pay all that much attention. Well, New York, Milton Keynes. LA. Okay, I can see lots more people are joined now. So um, I'm going to start the webinar. So hello everyone and welcome to Top Tips for Dyslexia and Technology as part of Dyslexia Week 2021. My name is Annie Mannion and I'm Digital Marketing Manager at AbilityNet and I'll be running you through what you can uh, expect from today's session. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, David. So just to go through a few bits of housekeeping, um, live captions are on the webinar provided by Kimberly at MyClearText. So thank you, Kimberly. Um, you can turn them on using the CC option on the control panel. Uh, and there are also additional live captions via streamtext.net forward slash player question mark event equals ability net. Um, and slides are available at slideshare.net forward slash abilitynet and then also on our website at abilitynet.org.uk forward slash dyslexia dash tech. Um, if you have any technical issues and you need to leave early, don't worry, you'll receive an email with the recording, the transcript and the slides. And then depending on how you joined the webinar, you'll find the Q&A window. I see lots of you already have. Um, and if you want to ask David any questions, um, do drop those in the Q&A area for us to address after today's session. Um, we'll do that in a follow-up blog on our website. And then we also have a feedback page that you'll be directed to at the end, um, which invites you to tell us about any future topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars. Um, so please do share your feedback. Um, so that's it from me. So now over to David to present today's webinar. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So just to introduce myself. So my name is David. Um, it is Welsh, going back to the conversation about how sunny South Wales is uh, for David. Um, I'm the head of accessibility over at AbilityNet. Now, the very kind of complex nature of what I do can really be boiled down to I spend a lot of my time complaining about websites for a living and materially how inaccessible they are, which can be understood to various means, you know, e.g. whether or not it uh, pass and fails WCAG, um, or whether or not it doesn't meet certain expectations from a you know, usability point of view. Now, that all being said, what I'm coming to today is the fact that I have dyslexia. And what I'm going to be talking about today is my kind of experiences, as well as tips, specifically with how to make sure that the kind of the digital landscape is more or less accessible to folks such as myself with dyslexia. Now, I do want to throw open a caveat, and I really feel the need to do this in a way that I don't potentially with more kind of black and white um, areas of accessibility where what I'm talking about today are very personal and idiosyncratic experiences. It is what dyslexia is like for me and just me. And so the thing that I need to be mindful of is making sure that folks are not going to attend today's session and think, ah, that David folk, he told me exactly what dyslexia is for everyone. Because the thing to stress when we are talking about neurodiversity, diversity is the key word. 
And I, what I don't want you to do is kind of really kind of base your output. So everything that you do necessarily on me saying, this is exactly how it is for me. Um, these pictures that I've got on these slides are of two paintings of cats, and I'm going to be impolite to the person that painted these cats and say that they are not the best representations of cats that there have ever been. And the analogy I'd make is that it's almost as if whoever painted these pictures of cats potentially had never seen a cat before and potentially just based their interpretation of the cat based on maybe what they'd heard about cats. So ditto. Hopefully people get value out of today, but please don't take it as a kind of black and white. This is exactly what this lecture is like for all individuals. Now, in terms of what dyslexia isn't, so the first thing that I always stress to folks, because it's always the first thing people say to me, is they'll say, ah, it must be like that the words are constantly jumping around. And an example here is an article from CNN that says this is what reading is like if you have dyslexia. Now, I do know folks that will say that they kind of experience, um, uh, not tremors, not quite the right word, who kind of experience something where their kind of their eyes will kind of twitch and the words will seem to move and they struggle to kind of keep an individual focus. But I've not generally heard the kind of extreme of it's like kind of tripping on acid, that it's really like that everything is constantly in this whirlpool of words that's constantly moving around. Again, there might be folks out there that have that experience. It's just not something that I've experienced and it's not something that some of my peers have experienced. And it's a more of a subtle effect where things that you might come across like the CNN article are potentially more about emulating the outcome as opposed to emulating the experience. So what I will be talking about are some of the challenges that at least I have associated with reading and that have more potentially subtle um, manifestations and things like this air quotes dyslexia simulation are potentially more so about how you can experience that same thing about having this kind of cognitive challenge with interpreting what you're reading but that's not to say necessarily that that's literally experienced for me. Again, just want to throw up some asterisks before we really get our teeth so stuck in some of the stuff. Now, to more so be on the page of, well, okay, what is it? As I've already mentioned, it's really broad, and it's just, which is why I kind of wanted to stress that there is no one size fits all with this. But in broad terms, I can use some of the um, things that the British Dyslexia Association signpost, where you know there is some affect on reading and spelling. There's difficulty with things like phonological awareness. Now, that for me, that's a big one for me, where when you, for example, have a very young child, um, that often there seems to be a understanding of this overlap between the um, phonological sounds we make, how we write, how we speak, and, there's, and that there's this kind of, that it all kind of sits well together so that we say, huh, low, and but good but I and there are certain noises that we make and that how it affects then how we write and that just it was never something that made sense to me the overlap between how I write and how I speak just does not seem to exist uh, verbal memory again a really really big one for me uh, where it's less about my literal ability to read or to speak um, but it's more so this kind of working memory where if you think about it when you're reading and writing especially you kind of have multiple things going on in your head you for example have well that's the thing that i've just read that's the context with which i'm reading the current thing that i'm reading ah in the thing that i'm reading there are several call outs to potentially past events there's a word there that has a that is an unusual word but i know the definition of that word and this sentence is kind of building up something that's going to come in the next sentence and the next clause. So there's potentially multiple different things going all on at once. And one of the big things for me is the um, challenge associated with spinning all of those plates, where I can deal with one thing individually. And when I'm dealing with a lot of things concurrently, that's where the challenge comes in. And lastly, with processing speed, from the point of view of, again, if we're going through a book and we're doing all of those things at once at a very fast clip, the challenge for me is this kind of stop, stopping and starting, where 
my challenges potentially with the phonological awareness, with this kind of verbal memory, with this challenge of spinning with all these plates, that then has a halting effect where, for example, I'm reading the sentence, I'm going really well, I then come across a word I don't recognise, and where you might think to yourself, oh, I don't recognise that word, I'm going to hold that in my brain for a second, um, and I'm going to check the definition, I'm going to look it up, oh yes, no, I do remember the definition of that, and now I'm back in the room, that's more so a challenge for me, where it then kind of has a halting effect, and so it impacts my uh, efficiency of getting through information. There will also be kind of concurrent difficulties. So these are challenges that I would say aren't necessarily um, what I might consider to be kind of core factors of dyslexia, again, for me, um, but it's potentially more so that different folks have, um, where things like motor coordination, so, you know, just hand-eye coordination, writing things can be challenging, uh, mental calculation, again, coming back to this spinning multiple plates, one of the ways my dyslexia was originally um, was originally diagnosed was off the back of um, I can do things at a kind of a perfectly uh, reasonable level. It's just as soon as I'm dealing with multiple concurrent things all at once, I seem to disproportionately struggle. And so it's less that I can't do mental maths. And I, I don't. I wasn't, for example, diagnosed with discal dyscalculia, but that all of these things can have these kind of outcome effects. And lastly, with concentration, again, folks will often say to me, seems like you're not concentrating or um, I'm speaking to you and you, know, you don't seem to be focusing on X, Y and Z. And again, it comes back to this spinning of plates where if something is suddenly comes a curveball out of nowhere, has this potential halting effect on my concentration. And again, these are things that are kind of derived from the British Dyslexia Association. Now, those are really broad, right? This comes back into a kind of a sense of um, not necessarily, I, I, I'm keen not to be too overly medical, but those are more so the things where we kind of think about what are some of the experiences we might consider at a high level. And I want to briefly touch on, well, what are some of the really kind of practical experiences for me? Well, very practically, for me, it's that there is this, my brain cognitively struggling with information that the eyes send. Um, and it's not, for example, that I cannot read a page in a book. It's not that I literally cannot read a website. It's, again, for me at least, not that words are jumping around. It's not necessarily um, that I can't understand something. It's just there's some strange neurological processing where my brain will struggle. An example of this is I might write a sentence where I've used the exact same word three times. So I will say something like, um, today I went shopping, shopping, shopping at Tesco's. Now, I can read that sentence 20 times, and there is nothing wrong with my eyes, visual ability to perceive that I've said that three times. There's nothing wrong with my brain's capacity to understand that you know it needs to be, I went shopping at Tesco's. It's just there's some strange crossed wire where my brain just literally does not interpret that that is what my eyes are seeing because my eyes and my brain tells me the thing that's written there is just, I went shopping at Tesco's. It simply just doesn't pick up that information. As I've already alluded to, kind of limited short-term memory and digit span. So the main challenge for me is just this um, difficulty where I can only spin so many plates at once. So, and I really need to apply a very conscious effort to that short-term memory processing. Again, you're reading through something complicated. You potentially have not thought about it. You've potentially not thought of yourselves as kind of active readers or active listeners, because I get the same thing in a kind of verbal conversation where you're actually keeping hold of multiple things at once. What someone's just said, what they, you think they're about to say, how you think you need to react to what they're about to say, um, what they've said that maybe relates to past events. Yeah, there's lots and lots of plates that get involved. And I just kind of have this challenge where I struggle with lots and lots and lots and lots of different points and struggle to potentially keep that within what I, you know, the, the, within the holding cell of my short term memory. Again, it's not kind of word blindness, it's not the words dance, it's just there seems to be this kind of halting effect that goes on in my head. Again, for me individually. And, ooh, sorry, my mask has disappeared. Ah, there we go. Now, folks will often say, in terms of, okay, cool what are some of the things that have benefited you what have some of the ways in which you've overcome some of the stuff well i hate to say it and i appreciate that um, 
people potentially don't like to be reminded of their school days. But for a lot of folks such as myself, the very first time that dyslexia becomes a thing is in an is in an educational setting, uh, in as much as that's often where uh, the first signposting is. So someone might mark an essay you've done and said, hey, I've kind of noticed X, Y, and Z. I might throw you on someone. Um, potentially in work these days, but again, because well, I'm an old man, historically a lot of this stuff was in an educational setting. Now, the outcome of it was 25% um, extra time. Now, the... Um, the challenges that I'd say are associated with that is it helped. Yeah, suddenly I got that kind of processing time because it was less that it was less about my intellectual ability to do X, Y, and Z. But as I mentioned on the last slide, a lot of it came to this short term memory challenge. It was spinning lots and lots of different plates all at once that I struggled with. And so <clears throat> that extra time was more so focused on kind of of using that time to kind of free up myself kind of mentally for that space but materially I was still responsible for self-correcting it's also not fun to spend 25 percent more um, time in an exam setting and it also potentially has a lessening of self-achievement so it kind of promotes this imposter syndrome of well am I only here am I only here for example at this university uh, within this job off the back of potential um, accomplishments within the university because I got extra time and I, one of the reasons I mentioned uh, educational settings, again, it's partly because that's where a lot of um, initial diagnoses come for folks, but also where initial support comes for folks. But the kind of same things can be talked about within a workplace, where if, for example, someone in a workplace says, oh, yeah, I've, I've slacked your FYI, and the response is simply, okay, cool, um, you can get 25% extra time to complete a task, it's potentially falling foul of some of the same challenges, i.e., the responsibility on the individual to kind of labor through it with more time, which again, potentially isn't fun and potentially um, has this uh, imposter syndrome challenge. Now, one of the things I will say is that technology has been a huge boon for me. So I've got two videos on my screen. Um, I guess if I can, oh no, it's not letting me pause them. That, ah, okay. PowerPoint sometimes does not want me to pause videos. My apologies if they are distracting. Um, but there's kind of, the first for part of technology I'll talk about is writing support. So people will often potentially poo-poo autocorrect, but it has been a huge boon for me. So in the videos, all I'm using is iOS's native auto predict, where I'm typing in some text and then I'm selecting the text from um, a kind of snack bar of options saying, I think this is what you want. And it allows me to get through sentences in kind of double, triple time because I'm not making little mistakes and I'm going to go back and correct them. And it's reducing this cognitive load. As I alluded to this idea of the challenge of me spinning lots of plates, well, if I can take down one of those plates and say, okay, I'm not going to think about how I exactly spell that word. And I can said what I can keep in my head is the thing that I've just said and the thing I'm about to say. And I can worry less about, oh, is it the I before the E with that one? And just use the prediction. Now, that gets me out of jail free in a lot of cases. Um, I do also use things like global autocorrect. Um, people might also come off Grammarly. You can kind of think of these things as the kind of next level up from inbuilt prediction that I will say is getting much, much better. Um, I do personally use iOS uh, more than anything else because I think it's inbuilt stuff is really, really good. Um, but there's also third party software, again, like Grammarly, like, uh, like Gram. Uh, global is correct like Grammarly, where if you're in an system ecosystem, um, where you can potentially use that software to kind of get uh, the term you can kind of use is kind of auto prediction on steroids. Um, and they're also, and one of the things that I'll say is getting much better these days is how these softwares can learn your own habits. So uh, iOS, one of the reasons I like it is that the predictions are starting to realize the things that I do wrong and the mistakes I make and the sentences that I like to form such that I can just get a lot of stuff for free. Similarly, Global Autocorrect, it can tell me, I can bring up a menu that will say, FYI, you've spelt this word wrong a thousand times. So I know as soon as you start on this one, I'm just going to tweak it and I'm just going to put in the right spelling. Um, so the software out there can kind of learn, um, kind of learn your own personal foibles. 
there's also speech to text. And this is an interesting one that often folks don't think about because they assume, ah, well, you know, historically it was just writing. Yeah, historically, it was 25 seconds of time to spend more time, paper and pen, um, writing things out. But obviously now, like we're using technology in a way where literally writing paper to pen is not really as relevant as it was you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so I spend probably about 50% of my time, um, and it is context uh, sensitive, depending on whether it's private communication or something that I'm happy to kind of say out loud, um, dictating. So, for example, I use Dragon, uh, historically I've used Dragon Naturally Speaking, um, using Siri and Alexa, Office Dictate, uh, Mac OS and iOS Dictation. Again, I'm personally more so in the iOS ecosystem these days, where, you know, I could stumble for quite a while thinking, how am I going to spell this? Ah, how is it the I for E and what's the right grammar for this X, Y, Z? Or I can just speak it out loud. Now, I personally find it a lot easier, as you might be able to tell during during this webinar, speaking a lot of this stuff out loud. And so I can just dictate. And the some of those plates are again removed. The how exactly do you spell it, how do you X, Y, and Z, just gets taken out of my hands. And so I can more so focus on um, materially what I want to say. And the technology handles some of that information for me. And again, the big thing for me is just speed and efficiency. And so how quickly can I do the task and how, um, how efficiently can I complete the task without making mistakes? And just audio dictating allows me to do it more quickly with less mistakes. Now, the other side of the coin for this one is also text to speech, because again, as I mentioned earlier, it's input and output. So I can read some, uh, sorry, I can try and um, write something down and struggle with certain parts that I've, that I've already alluded to. But then I also need to get some information back, right? It's not just about me composing information, it's about me consuming information. Now, one of the main ways I'll do that, oh, this video will let me play it. Um, you may have like audio, where I can, for example, select all, and I can say, hey, I want this text um, to be spoken to me. I can then Now, what that then allows me to do is get that same information, get rid of some of those plates of, oh, what's that word and struggling with this neural processing, where it's almost, it's just like someone speaking to me, where instead I'm not interacting with my challenges associated with, how do I parse that? And, oh, that spelling is slightly different. That's not spelt phonetically. That's one of those strange English language rules where actually it's spelled X, Y, and Z. And I can say, hey, machine, just say this to me. And so what you might notice that it becomes more of a conversation that I'm having technology, as opposed to the arguably more old school kind of method of you know, having just a digital equivalent of paper and pen, you know, where I'd struggle with writing, I struggle to read my writing, struggle with typing for the exact same reasons, not because um, I'm struggling with the ambulation of my fingers, but again, those kind of short term memory, those processing challenges. And instead, I'm making it more into a conversation with my technology, where I'm speaking to my technology, and my technology is speaking to me back. Um, historically, I uh, use read and write on Windows, uh, Claro speak on Windows, uh, Office speak. So if you have access to the Office 365 ecosystem, uh, Microsoft more and more are putting this stuff inbuilt into their software. Um, but again, personally, at least again, I'm spending a lot of my time with some of the stuff that's inbuilt with Mac OS and iOS. Just because personal preference, it works really well for me. Now, the other thing that's worth me mentioning is that there has been a communication shift in, in, with modern technology that I would say has enabled me beyond my wildest initial dreams. That in as much as these days we can communicate with things like emojis, reaction stickers, animations like GIFs, uh, videos, you know, Skype, FaceTime, I can have some extras here that have kind of popped up through um, lockdown, you know, Teams, Zoom, uh, Slack, etc. Audio based media, so more so things like kind of being on a Discord call, and also like pictures, like Snapchat. Like how often these days are we communicating where we'll just say, oh, I'm just going to send a picture of this thing. Yeah, you know, I could type out a lengthy essay or I could just send a picture of the thing. Now, I do need to add an asterisk here that this is not to say to rely on these forms of communication. So in as much as 
different uh, user groups within the um, within the realm of accessibility are going to have kind of different access needs. Myself, I absolutely love if, for example, a sentence can be contextualized with an emoji. That really helps me because I can go from understand from struggling with context and intent. And again, that's another one of those plates. If I'm reading a sentence, understanding the words, understanding the definition, understanding things like callbacks, references to other things, and working out the context. Well, if some of those things are taken care of for me or are potentially supported by something else, e.g. an emoji, e.g. a picture, well, that really helps. That's one less um, thing that kind of reduces that cognitive load. However, to go with the example of, let's say you've got some text in a picture and the picture really contextualizes um, the text, in that example, you'd want to make sure that that text had uh, alternative text such that someone accessing that page with a screen reader would be able to access that same information. Ditto an emoji. Um, you would not want access to that emoji to be the be all and end all of understanding that information, in as much as, again, different assist technologies might not communicate what you think they'll communicate with that emoji. Um, so, again, it's, it's about saying that this has been a huge boon for me and applied sensibly and moderately they things like uh, things like icons emojis animations videos audio pictures they can really help and they really help me but making sure that it's not for but making sure that you don't forget the other accessibility considerations of these forms of communication and just to give an example so i've historically have used a facebook messenger quite a lot um, and if we really think about it well we can say well sure there's audio calls that are a part of them so uh, there's audio calls, there's video call options, uh, they're sending pictures, they're sending video clips, they're sending audio clips, um, there's just calling someone up, um, or independently of that, just sending someone some, your voice, just saying, oh, uh, I'll be there in five minutes. And, you know, if people think about it, like how many of us, plenty sometimes, just go, oh, I can't type this up, uh, I'm just going to send them an audio message, I'll be there in two minutes. And how many people, for example, in a group chat that has that one person that just really always loves to do that, just always loves to say, hey, yeah, uh, I'll be there in two minutes. You can send your location. So instead of, for example, me struggling to say, okay, I'm here with this postcode, and ooh, how do I spell Aberystwyth? I can never remember how to spell Aberystwyth. Oh, I can just press a button that just puts a pin on a map that just says, hey, beep, here's exactly where you are. And again, it's just removing those additional challenges. Uh, send stickers, GIFs, emojis. Again, asterisks for things like GIFs and emojis that you want to make sure that you're still communicating in a way that's accessible, but you can use multi-media, uh, multi-modal forms of communication to, again, kind of reduce the cognitive load. Now, I will also talk about some of the challenges that are more associated with what you might consider to be kind of bread and butter content. So big ones for me is unstructured text and unstructured information. So where things have no headings, where things have no lists, uh, images of text, and I'll explain why that's potentially a challenge in a moment, in as much as I might want to access that text, but might not be able to access it if it's kind of encoded uh, within an image, but a bit more on that in a moment. Things like homonyms and homophones. Um, so fair is fair, pair of pairs as examples. The reason, again, I individually find them challenging is that, again, it just adds to this cognitive load where you can imagine that reading um, is similar to kind of running. You're, you're spinning plates, you're running along, and you come across you know, hurdles. You come across, okay, cool, I think I know the definition of that word. And, ooh, I don't know the definition of that word, but I think I've understood it through the surrounding context. Cool. And you're all the same doing stuff. And stuff like fair is fair, where you go, ooh, that's an additional hurdle. What does that mean? Oh, yeah, that's a homonym. Well, that's a homophone where the words are, have been put in a way where it, you can kind of easily imagine that it just trips folks up. Abstract or overly verbose language. Again, this is not to say that everything that you, for example, publish on the web needs to be um, completely devoid of any language that could be at all considered um, uh, for example, technical, because you might work in an industry that, uh, let's say, is legally bound to include certain phrases. Um, you know, you might, I mean, you technically might work in a legal sector where, you know, you have to talk about things in a very specific way. Um, 
but outside of that, those kind of confines, making sure that you don't have overly abstract, so you are kind of direct and matter of fact, and avoid overly verbose language when you can be concise. So again, this is not me. To, this is not me saying that um, folks who do have restrictions, e.g., in, in, e.g., in the legal sector, um, but me saying that you know if you don't have those sectors, do what you can within that space. And also no alternatives for kind of text input or output. So an example of that would be something um, like if, for example, I'm asked to input my, um, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought for a second. Um, if, for example, I'm required to give my shipping details, well, I can put those in. I can type that in and then it says to me, hey, we need it again. Because let's say, for example, um, because let's say, for example, I need to give my uh, shipping address and then asks me again, say, oh, just to confirm, um, can you just give it again? We need to make sure it matches X, Y, and Z. Um, as opposed to there being an alternative, there being a little tick box that says something like, oh, no, no, this shipping address is the exact same that I used my previous order. Or classically, if it says, oh, what's your billing address? Again, the alternative there is a little tick box that says, oh, no, no, this is the exact same. Um, ditto, and this is again going back to the idea of making sure that what we're doing is accessible in broad terms. Um, someone um, who hates making calls, so some, for example, who is little D or big D deaf, they might say, hey, just give me an email address. Please just give me an email address. Um, give me a um, way to chat via text with a um, agent. And that is something that would be potentially a huge um, accessibility consideration for them. But at the same time, someone like myself might say, oh, I'm really going to struggle to chat with the agent through text. I'm going to make so many mistakes. It's going to be way easier for me to potentially just pick up the phone. And so again, it's one of those things about making sure that there are alternative means of communicating with folks. And also more generally with your content. So if, for example, you, know, you just have a table as opposed to a table and a graph, um, one of them is requiring that I kind of try to understand, e.g. a table versus the graph that potentially is going to be more accessible to me in as much as I'm going to have a better experience with a more visual medium. Now, to give an example of what some of this stuff looks like uh, writ large, an example I would give is with the Lloyds banking app. And I can, I can name drop them because as, of, as we'll find out, they have fixed this issue. So historically, when I was trying to log into my bank account, uh, my banking app specifically, and I prefer using apps generally, um, because then smaller cognitive load, they're usually a lot more focused on a very specific tasks. Generally avoid desktop versions of websites because it's just an order of magnitude more complicated, more cognitive load, more plates to spin. Logging into the banking app, and I think to myself, well, I don't know my user ID. I, I don't remember it. And if I try and type it, I'm going to make mistakes. And that's fine. I'll jump back over to LastPass. I'll copy it, my username to my clipboard and I'll paste it into that field. And the app goes, that's fine. Cool. I needed to know that information. You've got it stored in a secure uh, vault. That's fine. What's your password, please? I do the same thing. I go, well, I don't know my password. Um, I don't know any of my passwords. And I you know, didn't want to give it a really insecure password, like you know, my name 101 exclamation mark. And so again, I'll go back to my vault uh, that's protected through um, face ID and I'll copy my password to my clipboard. And I'll come back to the app and the app will go, ah, unfortunately you left the app. And because you left the app, you need to go all the way back to step one um, in, this, um, in this process because you, you left the app and that's a security breach for us. So you need to make sure that you complete this flow without ever leaving the app. Now, how could I do that? Well, materially, I had to do it by writing down my username and writing down my password. So what was a security consideration because of my dyslexia resulted in a security risk because fundamentally it didn't allow me to uh, copy and paste information into the fields vis-a-vis, -vis, which would involve me briefly just minimizing the app for, for 30 seconds. Now, the solution to this problem was introducing Touch ID, such that I could access my boundful wealth. And it wasn't, you can think of it as not necessarily being a big change, but it went from, we need your username, we need your password, we need this across multiple screens, and we need you to never leave the app in order to do that, versus, hey, just use your fingerprint. 
Now in that first instance, in order to set it up, I still needed to kind of um, write down a process my password to that initial one um, to get through initially in order to set it up. But then I could do that once, and experience that again, that challenge experience, then enable touch ID, shred it all, done. And so it goes from a very inaccessible experience to actually what's a really accessible experience for me. And it was all about reducing that cognitive load. Now, in terms of what you can do, again, the main thing I say is just be succinct, be simple. Do not worry too much about being um, overcomplicating your information and just stress the very specific point you want to make. Now, I'd also say to section your content. So again, you, you can have something that is very simple and succinct. And then the next thing you want to do is making sure that you're then breaking up into logical chunks. Because the number one thing that I'll struggle with, if I see just a wall of information, I'll look at it and my brain will just go, no, there ain't no way I'm going to be able to do that. And that's kind of when I'll think about abandoning ship. Uh, using semantics. And again, this is the one that I said I'd kind of come back to a little bit. Um, uh, with, for example, images of text, is use semantics for your headings, for your lists, as there is an added benefit with compatibility with reader views, and I'll show that in a moment, as well as providing side-by-side -side alternatives for information. And I already alluded to this with what some of my challenges with copy are, and a big one is, is when there's no alternative mechanism to understand information. So, for example, the only way to understand um, some information that's presented is, you know, it is a graph and there's no table, or there's a table and there's no graph. Um, there are uh, a recipe and there is a video on doing that recipe, but then there's not the recipe in text, or the exact same thing in reverse, where um, there's potentially a recipe with a bunch of instructions to follow, and I potentially would then really struggle with some of the individual, maybe the language use, some of the guidance in it. Um, and so I'd say, okay, cool, let me just let me just watch the video because then it will make a lot more sense to me. Now, what I said I would do is I'm going to quickly just jump out of this deck. I'm just going to bring this over here for a moment just to show you what I mean when I've alluded to things like um, images of text and when I've alluded to <clears throat> semantics because one of the questions I often get asked is saying well hang on structural semantics that's like screen readers right and yes absolutely you know you for example want a heading to be a heading such that a tool such as a screen reader would be able to um, communicate hey um, pumpkin farmer started one pack of seeds heading level one and folks might say oh well but isn't that more so for uh, voice activation software? So, for example, you can give your command, uh, you can give your laptop the command, uh, press, press search, and it will be able to press search for you. Now, the technology I'm, I'm using isn't really in that ballpark. I, I alluded to using things like Dragon, but again, it was more so that I could highlight text and get it read out to me. Now, one of the things that I will use when I do use desktop is things like Reader View. So if I, I'm in Firefox at the moment, I can explain why I like to use Firefox. And again, I alluded to the fact that I really like apps because they're a lot more simple. One of the reasons I will use things like Reader View is I can go from a, something that's very, very cluttered um, with a lot of information that I don't materially need, and it can kind of strip that out and just give me the bare bones of what I'm looking for. So I, in this instance, I'm saying, hey, bring out all the other ancillary content and just give me this article. And this is where things like semantics can come into play in as much as I've just got some few more examples. So I've got an example here from, um, from the technology section about Windows 11. And if I scroll through, we can kind of observe that there are these subheadings. So in this instance, there is a heading level two. And if I activate Reader View, we can see that this kind of structure seems to have been adhered to where it's got the text, it has the headings, it has the pictures. Oh, it seems to be missing some lists, that's okay. But what I can do if I go back into this, and I go to a uh, new era, and all I'm gonna do on this page is I'm gonna remove this heading and I'm gonna set it to be a span instead. So it's got the same class associated with it, but it's not heading in the same way. Here and visually, nothing has changed. But if I look at it in reader view, there we go. 
And this is where we need to be mindful with using semantics carefully. Again, this is quite a kind of simple example, but what this reader view is doing is it is kind of trying to say, cool, I don't think they need this information. I don't think they need that information. I'm gonna try and pull out the information that's in the main content. Well, how does it know what's in the main content? Well, because the developers put that information within, the, within for example, main tags. And it's making assumptions about, for example, the structure of information, e.g. which are the headings, uh, what are not some of the headings. And again, one of the ways that it's doing that is that it's saying, hey, um, is, is it using some of the semantic information? So we can see the difference, for example, between press start is a heading here, uh, new era, which isn't, which just seems to be falling in, just seems to be a new line conversation. The other thing with images of text is what I can do is I am going to press listen and I'm going to access some text to speech. Now, again, this is not a screen reader per se because what I'm using, I'm still using a visual GUI. So this isn't something where I'm controlling my entire system with my keyboard with swiping gestures. This is something where I'm still physically observing the screen and I'm just using a menu um, to say, hey, can you read some stuff out to me? If I press play, I'm not going to go through the entire thing because I'm assuming you kind of get the brief gist of this. Again, my personal use case for this is less so about um, uh, navigating through an entire, um, uh, sorry, I lost train of thought, um, is less so about me navigating through the entire screen like this and more so about where things are just really confusing me. So again, what I'll generally do, again, where possible, I will use a native app much more simple, much more streamlined user experience. When I can't, and I'm used to, you need to use a desktop example, I'll more so then be using Reader View. My personal Reader View, I hate to say it because I'm otherwise in iOS and Apple's uh, camp. I do like Firefox's Reader View. I think it's a bit more advanced. And I will use this text-to-speech when I come across things that have that halting effect. So again, I'll be reading through the page, um, ideally because of the semantics that will be used. So if I, I'm just going to refresh this page actually to get rid of some of the weird adjustments I've made. There we go. So that's now heading again. Um, hopefully it's been structured in a way that, that's nice and logical. And then if I come across something where I'm like, ooh, I'm stuck on that, that's more so going to be where I'm going to kind of highlight that information and... where I'm more so they're going to drill down onto really specific bits of content. So again, I'm not going to ask it, again, this is personal, uh, I'm not going to ask it to read out an entire page, but I'm more so going to drill down onto very individual parts. And um, I can see someone in the Q&A said I was referred to someone that came uh, to, to Workplace about how to use uh, Dragon, um, how to use it, struggles. But yeah, uh, dra one of the reasons I don't personally use Dragon, um, there are a lot of folks that are on very, very well, Dragon, um, is I find personally some of the inbuilt stuff that's inbuilt in Safari, inbuilt to iOS, and more so being built into Windows natively, is a bit more useful for my case, where I more so want to kind of strip out some of the extra information, e.g. with Reader View, and more so just want to individually get the, the little bits and pieces here and there. Now, to jump back to my slides, oh, I need to minimize this one second. Ooh, I'm not showing systems out. My apologies. What I can do is, so it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but I can share it and just so people get a flavor of what it's like. Um, so if I go to listen, again, don't worry too much about the speed. I can have it super slow, but I can super quickly. Don't worry too much about the voice. Um, I've, just, I've just got it set to devolves. If I just press play. BBC Co UK. Windows 11 launches with redesigned start menu by David Malloy. Five six minutes by David Malloy, technology reporter. In so it, it works in a very very similar way um, that you you'd experience if if you're using a screen reader. The big difference is that I'm um, I'm interacting with a visual GUI, but you can kind of get the sense that the the synthesized speech is the same core principle. Uh, my apologies, I didn't realise that I that I wasn't sharing system sound. My sincerest apologies. Um, to jump back to my slides. 
So already mentioned, so kind of being succinct, being simple, using semantics, we've already alluded to the idea of using semantics in such a way that they are, again, they're not, I don't say they're not as important, that's because um, it's more night and day when you're using a screen reader where you need to care about the semantics of every little thing. My personal experience with this lecture is it's more structural semantics um, that are kind of a core thing, e.g. your headings, your lists, your tables, um, because then it adds that extra level of compatibility and side-by-side -side alternatives. Now, in terms of what else you can do, already alluded to this, but provide alternatives. So um, one of the kind of best experiences I had the other day was something where it said, hey, can you kind of fill out um, your address? And I just gave my postcode and said, okay, cool, here are the addresses on this postcode and a little drop down, reduced loads the amount of typing. In other instances, um, it's, for example, when I've even struggled to type something out, it said, well, you know, we can detect your location for you. Do you want to do that? I press that button. Absolutely works fine. Ditto and the other example I provided is that just dropping a pin on a map. So if it's something like, oh, where, where do you want to uh, pick up this um, delivery delivery that's coming to you? And this is your vague area. I can really struggle to type out some really kind of arcane names of London street names, or I can just go pin on a map right there, please. And again, it's just about having the alternative ways to get access to the same information. Big one is multiple forms of authentication. Um, I will always kind of stress that authentication is going to be incredibly important because the, it, it's the front door. And if you can't get in the front door, it's just something I'm, I'm going to walk away from, such that if, for example, I can't access things like Touch ID, Face ID, and it's something where I'm going to be using that app regularly, I'm probably not going to use it. I'm probably just going to find out, the, I'm probably just going to find the competitor that does give me access to, in this case, biometrics. Avoiding custom keyboards. Now, this is more so if you're making apps. Um, so generally, you wouldn't have a, um, you wouldn't, uh, as kind of content creators on a website, you wouldn't be making your own keyboards. But let's say you work in an organization, at a university, for example, and you've got a student union app, as an example, or an app where people can track their coursework. Custom keyboards can be a big, big challenge. Um, in as much as if I go back a few slides, I potentially would not be able to access the uh, automatic corrections. I'm potentially not going to be able to access um, the dictation technology. And you are potentially not, I say potentially, it's going to be a very big challenge for you to um, replicate what comes for free with just a native vanilla keyboard. Um, the only examples I think I've seen once or twice on the web are more so where it's like, hey, you can't use um, your keyboard to type in X, Y, and Z. You need to use this on-screen virtual custom keyboard that providing for you. And it will be the same feedback where that would introduce quite a lot of cognitive challenges versus being me being able to use my own air quotes keyboard where a lot of the time, uh, even if I'm using my MacBook, I'll be giving kind of voice dictation to my machine. Also, lastly, is making sure that we're supporting kind of autocomplete functionality. Um, so one of the big challenges, again, is with authentication. And one of the big um, updates, for example, that we saw with WCAG in WCAG 2.1 um, 2 was requiring that autocomplete values be used on form fields that are collecting information about end users. And this is something, so if, for example, you have a website that is ever collecting information that could be their name, uh, their address, uh, their, uh, uh, their title, so Mr, Ms, Doctor, etc., uh, or even things like their username, then you should be using the autocomplete value such that that user, similar to that example with Lloyd's, can set that information once on their browser so they can, for example, say, so they can say something like, uh, I'm just going to go into my browser, e.g., uh, or into Apple ID and say, this is my name, this is my address, blah, 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 blah. And then when they get onto a website, that that information is just automatically um, provided. So if I just jump out really quick, and I'm going to jump back over to my, oh, interesting, sorry, my, browser seems to have disappeared into the ether. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
bring over this one. I'm just going to type in that identify input purpose just to give you a flavor of some of the um, ba, 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 some of the criteria I mean. And I need to go here, I believe. And then I need to jump down. There we go. So in as much as a lot of websites will provide the same information again and again. So it will very commonly say, what's your name, please? Um, you might come across some, some phrases that seem unfamiliar to you. So uh, WCAG and the HTML specification talks about things like uh, honorable prefix, again, Mr, Ms, et cetera, uh, additional name, uh, middle names, for example, versus things uh, as well as things like usernames, your address, your postcode, uh, your credit card information, your birthday, uh, your telephone number, email address. This is the sort of information that gets requested from users kind of again and again. And so one of the things that you can do to really reduce the cognitive load is if you're working with developers or you know your website is asking for this information, making sure those attributes are supported. Such that if you come across, I think if I come back a few times, I believe there's an example from here where exactly in a form field like this, I could manually type it out and really restruggle or autocomplete. It's already set up with my browser and it just gets done. And very, very similar to what um, you could, you'd see, um, the, you, the, similar to the result that you'd get with biometrics, like the touch ID and face ID. Um, I can see that Sheila's asked what browser I've been using. I've been showing off two browsers. I've been showing off um, Safari, um, but also Firefox. So when I was showing off that reader view, that was Firefox. Ba, 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 ba. I jump back to my slides. And also to make sure that when you are getting feedback, that you're getting feedback that is more than kind of your core target audience. So you will, if you're, for example, you are trying to answer the question of, well, is this information as clear and precise as we really need it to be? If materially you're asking a target audience that are very au fait with the terminology you are using, that are your kind of key target audience, then that's all, then they're probably always going to feed back to you. Yep, absolutely makes sense to me. Um, versus when you're do getting that feedback, e.g. in user testing, more informally, if you're kind of asking them the question of, does this all make sense? You potentially just will be getting feedback that you simply would never have realized otherwise, in as much as you'd be getting feedback that says, oh, I really don't know what this term means. And you potentially would never have thought of that because you've just been invested in that term for the last you know, five years, as an example. So making sure that you are procuring feedback that exists outside of a kind of real um, core niche. Lastly, is avoiding cognitive tests. Now, this is very similar to something that I've just seen in the Q&A that kind of talks about um, data privacy and security, potentially. Uh, so uh, encryption data security, where, where possible, you want to make sure that your authentication does not rely on cognitive tests. Now, the broad way of defining this is making sure that you are not relying on the user really needing to kind of go away and apply a lot of cognitive load to a task that that, that information is not necessary for. And that's, so for example, a very simple thing is saying if you have to transcribe characters as opposed to copying and pasting them. The example from that Lloyd's app was a cognitive test because it was saying to me, hey, you need to remember this information. You need to get it from wherever you've got it, you know, in the banks of your brain or in LastPass. You need to then keep it in your head and then you need to transcribe it perfectly from your head down on, onto, into the app, onto, onto paper. And that's a cognitive test. Similarly, if you kind of have as part of your login saying something like, you know, um, what's the square root of 3 million? Again, it's a cognitive test. Now, this isn't to say that you can never have any cognitive test ever. You, for example, you know, you might be a university and what you might be talking about is a, an exam. It might be something where, you know, the point of the exercise is that you are trying to get to the, trying to assess whether a student understands certain things. And so that's where I'm adding that asterisk of, you know, cognitive tests that are not relevant to the exercise in question. 
Um, the kind of caveating here is that folks might say, oh, we use captures a lot. And a lot of the times captures will require, for example, users to answer a math question or work out kind of common um, and work out, for example, um, oh, which one of these images um, is a bus as an example. And that again is where there is that fine line between, for example, the uh, how robust your database is in terms of being protected from spam versus how many cognitive tests you have to get access to things, e.g. to uh, submit the contact us form. And again, the thing I will stress is provide options. So if, for example, uh, I'm on your website and I'm not logged into your website and you've got a capture on your contact us form because you say to me, look, now that we'd love to have zero cognitive tests, but we really need this capture and we know that it can introduce cognitive tests um, based on you know, variables outside of your control. Uh, however, if you go onto your app and you log into your app for your face ID, we won't give you that same capture because within that context, we know who you are, we know you're logged in, and suddenly there's not that same context uh, where we're really needing to protect ourselves from spam bots. Again, that's not me saying that that's the ideal scenario, ideal scenario is that cognitive tests wouldn't exist in the first place. What I am saying is try to be, um, try to do what you can. And if you come across things where you're thinking, oh, we are having to make hard decisions here, try to find different options. Again, avoiding custom keyboards. It's going to be rare unless you're building apps, um, but also making sure that you support autocomplete. I think I've seen uh, a few uh, organizations that kind of have this um, battle between a uh, legal that say you can't do autocomplete and accessibility that says again within the context of WCAG and again my own personal experiences that will say actually autocomplete is of huge huge value um, and in many cases that is going to be a conversation for that internal organization um, recruit user testers procure feedback from outside of your core audience and have a style guide for example, the uh, British Dyslexia Association is probably my favourite. Uh, there's quite a few different ones out there that's more detailed than font choice. Now, if I just open up this link really quickly. Ooh, and it's opened up on another window. My apologies. Give me a moment to drag it over. Sorry, my machine is being very strange today. I do not think that it likes that I'm screen sharing. There we go. And so I drag over the British Dyslexia example. And some of the things that it kind of goes into is saying, well, sure, do try and use a good font. Um, for example, using sans serif fonts in certain instances, and here's some examples, but also try to have a font that's kind of at least this big and try to make sure, uh, for example, that you're using nice letter spacing, um, avoiding, for example, underlining a tag's emphasis, uh, avoiding that all caps, using things like uh, headings and structure, uh, color, so again, avoiding, um, uh, avo avoiding, for example, um, backgrounds that are really multicolored and have really kind of complex uh, patterns or kind of um, uh, like, for example, what you're scrolling through the page and the background is really changing from loads of different kind of complex uh, pictures. You might, and again, it comes back to this idea of adding to the cognitive load. If you've got a really kind of simple, really neutral background versus something that's really complicated, like a really complicated pattern, again, that's just going to be something that's going to take up my attention. Now, again, I'm not going to go through every single point here, but just to say that there is more that you can do than font choice. And again, my, my personal one that I, I personally like is going to be the British Lecture Association, the links in the slides. And very quickly, I will just mention, um, you can sometimes think of it as being a get out of jail free card to use a font family um, that is kind of thought of as being you know, the dyslexia friendly font. Um, I do not want to step on toes and say, um, this font is amazing, this font is terrible. Because again, it is very idiosyncratic. What I will say is that some of the scientific research behind some of the fonts that are lauded as being um, the you know, perfect dyslexia font is not as good as it should be. It's not as robust and thorough as it should be. And it is also potentially, I say potentially, in my opinion, definitely uh, an overestimation to say you can use just this font and all the other challenges go away. 
because regardless of what font you're going to be using, you're still going to be wanting to use concise language. You can have something like Open Dyslexia as a font, and if you're using incredibly complicated language and content that hasn't been structured and chunked into you know, headings and lists, etc., well, that's materially not going to have the same benefit as a less air quotes scientifically accessible font where you have made very strong decisions in terms of the conciseness in terms of the technical jargon and how much you've chunked up your content into logical individual sections where that is always going to be the king again not not trying to poo-poo fonts too much um only to stress that there is a broader conversation to be had and there's broader things to be thinking about Now, those, because I've whistle stopped through my, some of my slides today, um, what I can just do, um, well, actually, I'll ask Annie. Um, Annie, I'm more than happy to spend a few minutes going through some of the questions. Otherwise, I'm okay handing back to yourself. What would you prefer that I do? Um, I think we're going to have to end the session because it's two o'clock now. So, oh, no. So, what yeah, but we will, we, will, um, we will go through uh, the questions and then answer any by text uh, on our web page. Um, that are outstanding to answer. Okay, yeah, I'll hand hundreds. back over to yourself then. I was about to say, I've been seeing them go through, oh, I really want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, in a couple of days, um, you'll be sent, uh, everybody that's that's registered um, will be sent an automatic uh, email that um, has the link to the web page that will have the answers to questions on there. Um, and also the recording and the transcript and the slides as well. But um, yeah, thank you so much, David. Um, some excellent points made and some really useful pointers to take away. Um, so just a few bits of information from me that might be of interest. Uh, we, we also run um, a range of online training sessions about digital accessibility. Uh, you can find out more at abilitynet.org.uk forward slash training. Um, we have a developers course coming up this Thursday, which is about ARIA and the accessibility tree. And then the following Thursday, um, about JavaScript and SPA considerations. And then on the 21st, um, accessibility testing in mobile apps and the 28th, accessible mobile development. And then um, you can also use the, uh, the discount code AbilityNet Webinar 10 um, for 10% off um, for webinar attendees. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, you can also um, sign up to our e-newsletter forward slash newsletter for the latest announcements about digital accessibility. And we have um, a suite of accessibility services to suit your organisation. And then finally, don't forget about our next free webinars at forward slash webinars. Uh, next Tuesday, we have Accessibility Insights with Disability Rights Campaigner Jonathan Mosen, who's also CEO of Workbridge. And then on the 2nd of November, our um, next HE public sector update with the University of Southampton. So thank you again, David, and everyone that's joined us, and we'll be in touch with you soon. Bye, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone.